15 and 30 minutes. GT cars from 1960 to 62 are go. The Jaguar E-Type snake away from the line with a good start made by John Beachall from the middle of the front row to head the pack down towards Madwick. Good start also by Tom Alexander in the white Aston Martin as they dive into the long right of Madwick. Emmanuel Impero in the Ferrari hung out to drive in on the outside line. Healy versus Jaguar ahead of him, but John Minshaw is building up a gap already as everybody else tries to be second. And the pole position, Aston Martin dropping back into the battle for third place. Manuel Piro was very tentative in what was a very damp qualifying in the Ferrari bread van. You'll see the red 250 GTO with a long aerodynamic tail. There it is, hovering around sixth or seventh place. But John Minshaw has gone off like a scalded cat in the E-type Roadster. He's already a full corner ahead. They're coming through in the battle for second through Fordwart. He's already through St. Mary's and up to Lavent as they get to St. Mary's. He's out of sight. And the Aston Martin in second place is bottling up the rest of the field. Tom Alexander it is, then hanging on to second spot, round the outside there, tries to go Jeremy Welch in the big Healy, number 11, lower down the order, another of the Healy's going strongly, is Richard Walker in 46. There is John Minshaw then leading the way, Emmanuel Impero almost getting squeezed towards the grass there, but he's back on track, they're three wide in the midfield, look as they come down towards us to the end of the opening lap, really going very strongly as well, the Ollie Bryant, Martin O'Connell, E-type number 10, Martin O'Connell at the wheel of it at the moment, and the gaps now start to come down as O'Connell makes a bid for another place, diving down towards the end of the opening lap, Jeremy Welch in the Healy right round the outside of Tom Alexander, Emmanuel Impero tries to have a go as well, down towards the chicane, Piro breaks late, the Ferrari goes ahead of the Aston Martin. It's one of the bigger grids of the day, it's been one of the more energetic opening laps, so John Minshaw leads the way at the end of lap one, second is John Young, third is Martin O'Connell, so it's E-type one, two, three, four, because you've got Gregor Fiskin running in fourth place, fifth is the Healy of Jeremy Welch, sixth the Ferrari of Emmanuel Impiro, with the pole man Wolfgang Friedrichs, the time done by Simon Hadfield, his co-driver, down in eighth place. And look at the Healy side by side drifting through. Keep an eye on 46 as well. That's an ex works rally car. And in the very wet qualifying, it was being driven exactly as if it was on the loose. Full lock stops for all the corners. Absolutely spectacular. And now in the dry, putting all of that spectacle into a tidier drive, carving his way up through the field. And the family owned E type at Healy. Vincent Gay, the Ferrari through on the inside of Tom Alexander, the next one to come up and challenge the next of the E-types is Richard Mines' car is there, Emmanuel Impiro goes ahead of Jeremy Welch, Jeremy specialises in Healy driving and preparing, but he's no slouch in other sorts of cars, there's a very crossed up E-type of contact and that puts Gregor Fiskin on the grass and around he goes, that I think was the O'Connell car that he made contact with, the bonnet is up and bonnet is down, but Gregor Fiskin then, rather roughed up out of all of that because the other E-type, I think he was Martin O'Connell, got sideways, came across and glanced him. Greg Fiskin carries off and he might have to make a pit stop here just for the effective repairs. But John Minshaw, look, the race leader has been reeled in by John Young. John going great guns in this E-type. He started his career a long time ago on the ovals but has been one of the mainstays of historic touring car and historic GT racing for a long, long time now. Mitchell sure leading and in second place then, it is John Young. Well, John Young in second has just gone around in 1 minute 35.7 compared to 1 minute 37.3 of John Minshaw. So getting on for 1.8 seconds quicker, no wonder he's reeled the leader in. And there is your pole man in the DB4 GT. Now in ninth place now, Friedrichs. And out of the pit lane comes the Lotus Elite, starting a lap behind everybody else, two laps behind everybody else. Pulled off from the grid, and there was uh, frantic work under the bonnet. As Gregor Fiskin is into the pit lane after that contact, so the team goes to work to try and make sure that the bonnet stays closed. Now, this is Emanuele Piro in the meantime, getting himself onto the back of Martin O'Connell, third and fourth, yep. these two around the outside goes Piro. And through he goes, the Ferrari takes the place away from the E-Type. We saw a lot of onboard from that Ferrari in qualifying, and even Emanuele Piro only using about seven or 8,000 RPM in that uh, Ferrari that'll rev comfortably up towards 12. He's using all of that and more. Little damage on the nose of the car in second place. So John Young's had contact with somebody earlier on, and Piro now has gone by uh, the uh, Martin O'Connell-driven E-Type, and that did look like the one that had the contact with Gregor Fiskin. It's been a little bit of bumping and boring, and when you're bearing in mind just what a racing E-Type costs, these things have been driven absolutely on the limit. And the bread man, unique, Manuel Piro, 
Porsche are doing the opening stint. We tend to have an owner or a gentleman driver and a hot shoe parachuted in for a little bit more excitement and pace. And some of them are putting the quick driver in second, some of them putting the quick driver in first. You can do exactly whatever you like with it. If there's a late race safety car, it's often a good idea to have your gun driver in at the end, but others send the quick driver out first, trying to build up an advantage for the gentleman, the owner, to consolidate to the finish. Well, there's no consolidating going on up front. It's nine-tenths of a second between John Minshaw and John Young, but in the second stint, Jack Young, John's son, takes over. Phil Keaton will take over the leading car. You put your money on Phil Keaton because he's just more experienced of the two, but there are other cars, and there's one of them, number one, Aston Martin, that's losing pace a bit now, but in the second stint, that should come back into the mix because Simon Hadfield will be behind the wheel of that car and Ooh. you can anticipate it to be in the mix change for the lead. we have the lead change problem for Minshaw that is not a normally quick driven E-type now he suddenly seemed an awful lot slower new race leader John Young there he's up and past John Minshaw who is fighting back so Minshaw loses the lead loses a couple of lengths almost like it was a missed gear or just the result of a mistake but he's yes. staying with John Young he's not giving up is he no he seemed he was dramatically slower though John Young just leapt in front of him as if it certainly wasn't a pass he just went by a stationary car almost so maybe Minshaw got himself crossed up at sixes and sevens he had a couple of spins in an earlier race in a Lister Nobly uh, that started from the front row of the grid Manuel Ipiro in third place the only non-E type in the top three Martin O'Connell's car is a couple of seconds behind him in fourth position Mitchell with one hand off the wheel going into Madrick, the first corner here, and that's not necessarily the best way, you might think, for car control. I wonder what other issues he's got maybe inside the cockpit. John Young, race leader, is not getting away, and behind these two that are now scrapping is Emmanuel Ipiro lapping quicker as John Mitchell tries to get his lead back. He has a look up the inside, but the car to keep an eye to now is the Ferrari in third place. Emmanuel Ipiro is getting a little bit closer because he's lapping faster than these two squabbling big cats up the road and John Young is feeling the pressure because John Minshaw is right alongside him on the outside he's not going to make it work at Lavent he slots back in through the right hand and they come now almost nose to tail John Young hanging on to the advantage but only just John Minshaw right in the wheel tracks well not only is this fantastic racing for us to watch but it's fantastic because it's bringing Emmanuel Piro's Ferrari bread van into play his last lap the fastest in the race two and a half seconds quicker than these two and that's bad news I'm afraid Quite a few of the pits as the leaders dive down towards Woodcut. Race leader John Young and drama there. Off the road goes Wolfgang Friedrichs. Off the road goes Richard Mines in the E type. Mines is back on. Friedrichs is back off. He's gone from one side of the road to the other. Here are the two race leaders. It's all happening. John Young just ahead of John Minshaw as they come across the timing line. We've still got just under 37 minutes to go. Yes. And it's John Young in the lead by three tenths of a second. And Emmanuel Ipiro with another fastest lap of the race is only 2.6 seconds off the race lead. And he went 2.8 seconds quicker than the leaders on that last lap. So within a lap, if they continue this battle, he will be right with them. Let's see what happens. Well, the Aston just got out onto the dirt. Richard Mines did the same on those snowy curbs. And uh, the Elite and the Healy right behind, they dodged the bullet as cars went on in either direction. There was no safe way for the driver to go other than continue straight down the middle of the circuit. Luckily, it worked out for them. So the lead battle fully inches apart as they go by a TVR Grand Tourer. And here we go. Challenge from Minshaw, trying to retake the lead on the inside. He's got the overlap, can he hold on to the power? He does, and drifts his way through, exiting Ford Water, back in front. So whatever the delay was, a few laps back, John Minshaw has driven around the problem, and he's put the E-Type back where it was. In other words, ahead of John Young's similar car, as they blast now down towards Woodcut once more. But this is the man that is catching, catching, catching. You're on board with Emmanuel Ipiro, and the gap coming down and down, absolute best in the first third of the lap here. So it's very nearly now three for the lead at the end of lap six. And even in the rain, he made up so much ground on other cars under braking. You know, there's the mark of a real professional race driver as he finds it in the, in the most difficult transition from power to braking down into the chicane. And the Ferrari is white right with them. The top three covered by half a second. John Minshaw leads from John Young and Emmanuel Piro. Fantastic battles, 35 minutes still to go.
So two E-types versus the Ferrari, 35 minutes on the clock. John Minshaw just leads the way. At any moment, John Young is going to have to start to attack and defend at the same time. He wants to try and get back into the lead of the race, but he's being caught hand over fist by the charging Emanuele Pirro, a huge Goodwood enthusiast, of course, and as he comes now towards St Mary's, look at the amount of effort being put in behind the wheel. A fabulous battle between cars that were so successful. The E-Types always had a good time here at Goodwood, particularly in races like the Tourist Trophy. And here is the view from Emmanuel Ipiro. You've got the two E-Types in front, jigsawing the, the lap together as they duck and dive. And Ipiro is looking for the advantage. Look at the rev counter needle. Way up into territory it never explored yesterday. Right up to 11, 12,000 RPM. A little crunchy gear change. That's lost him half a car length but he is still right where he needs to be. The chicane is coming up out of Woodcote as they head down the back of this Goodwood circuit and he is really in hunter killer mode now. John Young losing a length against Binshaw because he's had to think about defending. Remember as well, we're not that far off the pit window opening. Everybody has to make a pit stop, change drivers. John Minshaw just gets the car slowed down in time as they scramble through the chicane on board with Pirro. Grabs the gear now, hunting down John Young, makes his move to the inside. Side by side for second place. Emmanuel Pirro is on the inside of the Ferrari. John Young in the E-Type brakes as late as he dares. He turns in ahead, down a gear goes Pirro, turns through Madwe, and John Young comes out ahead. Wonderful cyclist. Fantastic racing, of course. Emmanuel Pirro is the hot shoe here. Uh, the two quicker drivers for the E-Types are waiting in the pit lane, and you sense that immediately the pit window opens. They'll go in and change. That will leave Pirro out front, and he will stay out front as long as he can to try and build as much an advantage. So it's it, it, two different race strategies going on here. The quicker he can get by these E-Types, the better. If he has to wait for the pit window, that's another five or ten minutes of racing. He can't use the outright pace. Again, he brings the Ferrari the long way round, but there's the slower Lotus Elite in the way. He can't get through there. So it's all about placing the car on the road, and John Young knew he was safe. Now, John Binshaw, the race leader, will give way to Phil Keane, who is very quick indeed. John is no slouch, but that might well be a car that comes in at the very start of the pit window to maximise the time for the quicker driver, Phil Keane, on board with Pirro. Still staring at the back of John Young's E-Type, which is still staring at the back of the John Minshaw E-Type. We're two and a half minutes off the window for the pit stops opening, and Young fighting back for the race lead, a tighter line into Woodcut. John Minshaw cuts across, takes the apex for the second element of the corner, hangs on to the race lead, and his heart sinks because there's another back marker up the road they're going to have to negotiate in a moment. The Lotus Elite of Nick Brunson will be negotiating. Which way do they go? John Minshaw is through. Pass goes John Young, pass goes Pirro, but Emmanuel this time is denied a real chance to challenge for second place. Well, Pirro was in the catbird seat there as the last of the cars. The two in front were going to concertine it up towards him, but he couldn't find room down the inside because that's where the Lotus was. John Young, John Young went around the outside in his dark E-type coupe, fixed head, and uh, hung on to second place. A full eight tenths of a second covering the top three. In fourth place, the Martin O'Connell E-Type that had an earlier incident, 16 seconds off the lead, so 15 seconds behind these guys. He's upping his pace, Martin O'Connell, but he's not lapping as quickly as these three, despite the fact that John Mitchell again goes wide. You think that they're holding each other up by squabbling, but three for the lead. Look at this! Minshaw, Young, Pirro, that's the order. Pirro with the fastest first sector of the race of anybody so far. And in fourth place, Martin O'Connell needs to keep his pace up because he's on Vincent Gay in the Ferrari 275, right up his exhaust pipes. It's another E-type versus Ferrari battle for fourth, but we can't see it because we can't take our eyes off this. Pirro is going to have another look down into the chicane, but the E-type closes the door. Pirro being hugely respectful of the car's value and other drivers, he could stick his nose in, but he's just biding his time, waiting for the moment and realising that he just don't have to force the issue. There's no point making contact. And let's see where he makes the move. He's done it once at Madrid. Here he comes again. This time he's got the inside line. Now, is he going to be absolutely level as they get to the braking area? Almost, almost, almost. He's got the inside line. He's got the tighter line and he hasn't got the place. Yet again, John Young is able to come charging round the outside. 
and Pirro working oh so hard behind the wheel of the Ferrari still can't prize away past him. The Ferrari picks up so beautifully out of the chicane, it's right in the power band, but the E-Type's XK six-cylinder engine just keeps it in front. As you saw, Pirro almost had 100% overlap, and the E-Type just had enough to open that, and the driver change window is about to open. And it is now officially open with 29 minutes and 50 odd seconds to go. So does John Minshaw come in this time to give Phil Keane, his co-driver, the maximum time behind the wheel? John Young quicker than his son Jack. Emmanuele Pirro is quicker in the Ferrari in third place than the uh, car's owner, Lucas Halusa. And now he's about to make his move for second place. He's going to be on the inside for the Lavin King if he can get up alongside, but that would be the outside for Woodcut, so he has to slot back in. The three of them starting this lap were covered by only half a second, first to third, and John Minshaw it is who still leads the way as John Young's car quivers under braking. Now, will Minshaw do another lap or will he bail this time? Let's see, they come down towards the chicane, John Young thinks about the inside, but as much as that's a look for the lead, it's to defend second from the Ferrari, and John Minshaw comes out of the chicane and does another lap. Yeah. <laughs> Sucker punches everybody by going along the pit entry road. We have had a couple of changes. Rob Huff has taken over from Richard Mines in their e time. And we've also got the man who set pole position, uh, Simon Hadfield, in the DB4 GT. So we can expect to see that coming up the order. They go by uh, Holly Mason, Frank Keaty in her, her beautiful ACH, very much looking like a road car that's straight in. Mind you, look at the car in second place. You know, fixed head E type coupe. It doesn't have any semblance of looking like a racing car from the outside, but boy, does it go like one. Through St Mary's and through the traffic they come, Martin O'Connell out, Ollie Bryant in. So the Jaguar in tight, set to rejoin the fray. Ollie Bryant's second mount of the day. Busy boy at these Goodwood revivals and leaders again are through traffic. Pirro trying to look a little wider around the outside. That's the uh, E-type drop head of Gregor Fiskin and Marino Franchitti. That was the car that was nerfed off earlier. And Fiskin was lucky that it didn't just turn sharp right here into those barriers, but actually spat back left across the track where there was more room for it to slow down. John Young making another move here, possibly. Pirro has dropped back a length or so in the traffic. So John concentrates on the race lead but John Minshaw is a wily old fox. He knows exactly where to position the car. Uh, John Minshaw excels in modern as well as historic GT cars. E-Type in Strife number 62. It is the Cook Thomas car. Uh, sorry, the uh, Michael Sam, Lyons yeah. Sam Thomas car. And that is Sam Thomas having started out of the race. Yeah, it's a shame for them. Uh, he was in eighth place, actually. Hadn't handed over to Michael Lyons, so Lyons doesn't get to drive it. And here is the lead trio in traffic, and you can hear how much more slowly they're going and how much more the cars are weaving around. So John Minshaw in that pale grey car with the distinctive blue hood being waved by. And that's the uh, Aston Martin DB4. There is Sam Thomas, unfortunately, very smoky under the hood. It looks like it's blown an oil line on the E-Type. Leaders back up to speed. More traffic ahead of the race leader then as they dive down towards the Barriers, the Lotus Elite. Mark Gordon and Nick Finber's car is the one that's going to get out of the way. Minshaw through, John Young. Next will dive up the inside and Emmanuel Pirro again goes for the gears. Wait, he dares on the brakes. If you ever wanted to know what it was like driving an Audi R8 Le Mans car through traffic, hunting down a GT, this would have been the sort of view. Yes. Pirro's got a little bit in of, of pace, a tiny amount, but nowhere really to use it. And he's trying to work the traffic. But there's so much of it now. Actually, John Minshaw is doing a stellar job just to keep his nose in front. There's John Young right behind in that dark green fixed head coupe. Jaguar number seven is all over the back of him. Piro being hamstrung by traffic. He's caught the elite at just the wrong part of Woodcote going in. And then the Porsche right in front of him. That's not going to help either. The E type's almost overlapping as they come through. Minshaw into the pits this time. He is. So a change of lead. John Young stays out. So does Emanuele Piro. Phil Keane will take over the car that was leading the race then. A, a great stint by John Minshaw. He is a lot better than some people give him credit for, but uh, that was a, a tremendous job to hang on to the race lead for the bulk of that stint. Out he gets, in gets Phil Keane. John with good racing stock, Dan Allen Minshaw for many, many years, a small racer in saloons and GT cars. 
Now, Emmanuel Piro has a go not just for second, but now for the race lead against John Young. But he still can't do it. And again, everywhere Piro wants to be, there's a back marker. Yeah, every time he finds a bit of a run around the outside, the reason that the E-Type is hugging the inside line is because there's slower traffic. And John Young is navigating as the race leader through the traffic just as well as John Minshaw did. Minshaw and Keane very quick in modern GTs. They're racing the British GT Championship as well as in this Sterling Moss Trophy. And they're a great combination of uh, youth and experience. Now, Hero, it's hard to imagine he's got this little advantage over the E-Type, still can't get by. And that bulky gearbox, that change up is not helping. He's missing that every time. Looks like he's getting more recalcitrant. Is the E-Type starting to smoke a little, or is that the Ferrari? There's a whisper of smoke from somebody, isn't there? Yeah. So John Young leading the way. Pit stop imminent. Many really Piro behind. It's the E-Type that's the smokier of the two, isn't it? Mm. So John Young leading, hand in the air. But yeah. will the car rejoin after this pit stop? Yeah, so that's the signal to Emanuele that he's going into the pit lane, so he doesn't catch the Italian by surprise. I think that's rather more smoke even than half a lap ago from John Young. So that E-Type in the pit lane. Emanuele Piro is now our race leader by some 11 seconds. Uh, from, in fact, about 15 seconds now from the Welch Healy. And that's, you know, that's not them coming down. It's, so uh, the Welch Healy in second place. But the Youngs, there's a lot of oil smoke coming out from under the bonnet. That's my limited experience of old cars. That's not a good sign. That might not be returning. Or if it does, well, it will go out. It might not be for many laps. But let's see. Jack Young is now installed behind the wheel of it. A good stint by Dad John then, and out it goes. Looking underneath, as you can clearly see underneath the car, this vintage to see if there's a trail of oil coming out from underneath there isn't yet, but it is smoking heavily. That's not good news at all. There's Phil Keane having taken over John Minshaw's car. He should be ahead on track now after the pit stop. Yes, he is. So he retains track position. And look at the gap that has been pulled. So, yes, I grant you, there was a bit of time spent in the pits having a look at the Young's e time before it was sent back. But there's the smoke still. Well, the gap now that Phil Keane has over the number 70 type is a huge one. And we need to see where this car blends back in after its pit stop. Emmanuele Piro now needs to do qualifying laps and in order is. to try and build the gap over the Jaguars. <laughs> ready for Lucas Alusa on the pit stops. So okay. Piro will stay out for at least one more by the look of it. And two things work in his favour. First of all, the cars that were in front of him, again, that grouchy change up into fourth, the cars that were in front of him are no longer in front of him, holding him up slightly, and they were holding him up slightly. He's just on the fastest race lap, 1 minute 31.5. Next quickest lap is a 33.0, so 1.5 seconds quicker than anybody else. The second thing that works in his favour now, fewer cars on track because other cars are making their pit stops, and that's why staying out longer often works well. It breaks up the gaggles, it breaks up the racing battles that you're going to catch. You're more likely to catch single cars, and that's more likely to give you a chance of getting by and keeping the speed up. So all these things are exactly why Emanuele has started and, and stays out as long as he can, right till the end of the pit stop window. Anthony Reid getting in, one of the team captains here. All of the drivers are uh, in four different teams, named after uh, members of the Duke of Richmond and Gordon's family. And his overalls showing the colours. Uh, blazer, but the team captains wear the pale blue stripes. And that car handed over by Vincent Gay was in a, a top four battle, so they've dropped down now, but Again, Anthony Reid behind the wheel would not be hanging around. There was Emmanuel Piro hanging around. Though. This is the car leading on track, but we need to see whether he's done enough in these laps to overhaul Phil Keane uh, when the pit stops are all done. How many more laps will Emmanuel Piro carry on for? Let's see. Turns his way out of the chicane. Inch perfect, blasts his way now up towards the timing line. Another lap in the book for him. And acknowledging the pit board, which I suspect said in, so he will do this lap and then come in to give way to Lucas Halusa, the car's owner. Now, where, in terms of lap time, does Phil Keane slot? That last lap for Emmanuel Perro was the first seven. Phil Keane has yet to come across the line on his first proper flying lap, so we'll see it in a moment uh, and compare and contrast the lap times. Lower down the order, Rob Huff doing amazing sector times. There, 33, Phil Keane getting well and truly stuck in the traffic because there's a pesky Lotus that 
is right in the way. That's the Nick Finver, Mark Gordon car that gets out of his way now, but you could see the commitment that Phil Keane was putting in, but he could not find a way by. The lap time, therefore, is affected, and it's a 35-6. In other words, Pirro is lapping quicker and should rejoin ahead after the pit stops. Yes, but the gap to the leader is 36 seconds. They're going to lose at least half a minute, surely making the driver change, even if the driver change is like greased lightning. And the GTO has got big doors, long doors and a decent roof line. All the same, it's going to be very tight indeed. And Lucas Halusa will have a fired up uh, Justin Keane behind him. And, and the advantage that Keane has is that he'll be familiar with the car, three or four laps in, he'll have it working the way he wants it, he'll be dancing around, and so he'll be the man chasing, and that's always easier than coming out of the pits, trying to defend the lead. Emmanuel Epiro down to the chicane. This is the man who leads the Moss Trophy on track and starts to undo the belts in readiness for what has to be a lightning quick change. Into the pits he comes. Lucas Halusa stands ready. The pit lane is fairly empty because most of the stops are cycled through, so there's no traffic in the way. Good timing in that respect. The door opens and Piro will squeeze himself out. He unfolds himself now. In gets Lucas Halusa. But the question is, will that car rejoin before this? e type with Phil Keane working overtime behind the wheel. You can see it. Takes over the lead. Well, the final advantage for the bread van of the Manueli Piri, Piro staying out late is just that, an empty pit lane. But the leader will soon be the number 33 E-Type Jaguar. The bread van's on its way, so the Ferrari leaves and comes out in second place, at least for the moment. Uh, third place, and yet to stop and running very long, is the uh, Jeremy Welch Austin Healy, car number 11, uh, ready to hand over to, to Katrina Kilova. There it is, Jeremy Welch at the wheel of it. It's a big gap there that Phil Keane has over wow. Lucas Halusa now. And there's the car, uh, Eddie Gans still, and it has now stopped, so he's dropped out of fourth place. So we're looking potentially at, uh, there's Jack Young in the very smoky E-type. He is third on adjusted uh, positions after the pit stops, because they've made their stop. Race leader is Phil Keane in the car, started by John Mitchell, you're looking at it now. Perone Halusas, Ferrari in second. Uh, the Welch Healy will drop back, so the Youngs will be third. And then behind them is Anthony Reid in the Ferrari 250 short wheelbase, the silver car with the yellow highlights that was started by Vincent Gay. And that is how far behind? That is uh, a second and a half ahead of Rob Huff's E type, who's just set the fastest race lap. So, all sorts of closing up of the concertina going on behind. And there's the lead gap, six seconds. I can't see Phil Keane being caught in this, uh, barring a late race safety car, because he's quicker than Lucas Halusa. The Youngs, in turn, have got smoke, and that car is not lapping as quickly anyway. And although Reed and Huff are lapping quicker, they're so far back now relative to uh, the race leaders that only really a safety car would bring them into the game. So. Uh, what was a great start to the race. Now, as we get into this second stint, gaps have opened up a little bit. But let's see, because these races, longer races for period GT cars, always tend to have a sting in the tail. And Piro, after a great job done, flat cap on, tells yep. anybody that will listen all about it. Breath in the air that both his sons are here, his wife's here as well. So, a very family experience for a man, Welly Piro. And uh, both the boys are race engineers working in Formula One and GT racing. Well, here is the Ferrari bread van, Lucas Halusa in second position. I don't think that Jack Young's smoky E-type, 16 minutes, you're gonna to have to sort of ignore the smell in your nostrils, aren't you? They've been caught from behind very quickly by Rob Huff with that pale blue stripe on his E-type. Rob Huff for second place is a real possibility in this, isn't it? Because he's gonna get past the Youngs without too much drama, and he's lapping Nine seconds a lap at the moment faster than Lucas Halusa. Admittedly, after the pit stop, so it'll be a gentle uh, outlap from a standing start anyway. But Rob Huff should be on for second spot in a car that, don't forget, had a spin early on. So, but for the spin, would Rob Huff be any closer and be able to challenge for the race lead? Discuss. Phil Keane up towards the end of lap 18, still through the traffic. A great display being put on him. Well, catching the AC Ace, which is now up to 21st position. Car has made its pit stop, so Holly Mason Frank Eaty has handed it over. The race leader Phil Keane. The car is up on its toes and dancing. You can see there's no spray coming up off the.
Alonso, 25 seconds quicker than the wet qualifier. Dirt. Admitted that the indicator has been on for a while as he comes up to get past Pat Blakeney Edwards, who's been a race winner at members' meeting this year. In uh, this race, he's in Martin Hunt's AC Cobra. There is Jack Young going strongly. He's not done that much racing relative to many around him, and he's about to lose out to Anthony Reid in the Ferrari, which will get up the inside, and Anthony Reid goes through for fourth place. Yeah, because in fact, Rob Huff's already got by, so that happened out of our sight. And there's Anthony Reid in the short wheelbase Ferrari. Absolutely gorgeous looking machine, and that's the basis of the bread van. Another 250 GTO, GTO short wheelbase. That's a longer wheelbase in the bread van with its aerodynamic cowling. And here's Rob Huff, here's hunting down Lucas Halusa, and you're absolutely right. Uh, Halusa might not finish on the podium, in fact, quite unlikely to finish on the podium. We're 19 laps in now as Phil Keane goes across the line. We've got 14 minutes. I can't see Lucas hanging on to a top three spot not even finish in the top four if that uh, young Ferrari, uh, young Ferrari, young uh, E-Type hangs on in the fourth position at the moment. So, Lucas Halusa versus Rob Huff, the World Touring Car Champion, closing on the Ferrari there goes Anthony Reid, hugely experienced touring car and sports car racer who has really found a very happy home of late in historic racing, especially here at Goodwood. Rob Huff, though, another new fastest lap of the race. Now, he's just taken four seconds out of Phil Keane's advantage. First to third is 26 seconds. It's still a tall order for Huffy, but it might come down a fair chunk more before the very end. There is Rob Huff, then, going through, carving his... might be a factor but uh, Rob Huff especially in a rear-wheel drive car around here is always an absolute joy to behold but E-Type wagging its tail as it goes through St Mary's and he's hunting down the Ferrari just up the road ahead of Lucas Halusa. Huff a mere 30 seconds quicker than they were able to get the car to go in qualifying in the rain and actually looking almost as sideways as he was in the rain there's Lucas Halusa in the Ferrari bread van currently in second place and here comes Rob Huff, Lucas's last lap, a 1 minute 35.3, Huff a 1 minute 30.8, so 4.5 seconds faster, he was 6 seconds behind at the line, he'll be all over him coming on to the next lap. But look, the car is never sideways, a wheel up the kerb, and the commitment being put in by Rob Huff is absolutely extraordinary, looking sideways through the chicane, this is how a rear wheel drive car should look, the gap second to third, was six seconds the gap second to third is 1.6 seconds huff does another fastest lap of the race and on this lap surely will take second place well one of the great things that rob huff does is not just drive the car because you're only as fast as your co-driver and the number of times he races various different cars with richard mines it's bringing richard's game up all the time his coaching is really bringing Richard Mines to the fore and he's getting quicker and quicker and so their overall pace through the race is getting better and better. So you hand Rob a top six car, chances are you're going to get a podium. The change for second place is imminent. Lucas Halusa in the rather more stable looking Ferrari is being given a hard time by the sideways E-type in the hands of Rob Huff. But back turns first, doesn't it? And then application of a bit of steering and a lot of throttle and he drags it out the other side. But this is one of these races where you want to hide the checkered flag because just watching Rob Huff is wonderful entertainment. And here he goes for second place, tries to find a way through the traffic, past the Ferrari and Lucas Halusa, which for the moment just staves him off. They lap the Healy 3000 of Katarina Kivanova. Now Huffy to the outside, and he's going to do it, coming into Woodcut right round the outside, flick the car in, balance it on the front. Look at that fantastic stuff! Right round the outside, completely broadside. Rob Huff goes second, and that, I have to tell you, is the move of the weekend. So far, 130.1, and look at that. He just got a fraction wide out there onto the curbs, and the car just going wider and wider and wider. And Huff winding on the lock, foot unflinching on the throttle. I've got this, I've got this, and sure enough, eventually, the car sees sense and comes back into line. Rob Huff is all over this E-Type. When you hear the phrase, the car's up on its toes and dancing, 
that's what it means. So, Rob Huff is up to second. He is lapping quicker than the race leader, but he's got to make up over 21 seconds in 10 minutes. That's not going to happen unless a safety car bunches them all up. And if we had a safety car this late, I suspect we wouldn't get many racing laps in at the end anyway. So it's a bit of a forlorn hope, but it's a joy to watch. And this was the sideways move. Rob Huff sideways out of the chicane, on the power, Round comes the back, lots of lock is applied, a bit more lock is applied, and he's back in the straight line. Yep. Just a little dab on the clutch there to straighten it back up. Even with that pass, Rob Huff's last lap, Rob Hub's last lap in traffic was a full second faster than uh, Justin Keane, the leader. So we've still got an upper, we've still got an opportunity uh, for this to for this to close up because Rob on average has been lapping two seconds a lap faster than he's the question is how much more tire is there going to be left that'll be but below the canvas and and through the cord soon there needs to be another award for the most sideways driver of the weekend and rob huff surely is in pole position to win that nine minutes are on the clock as he switches sides down towards madwick and the gap is down again to 19 seconds i've got to say that might be the uh, putu, uh, putative Henry Hope Frost fever trophy. Right now, I think Rob Huff might be in pole position for that. Here is our race leader then, the E-type drophead coupe. The traditionally convertibles don't make great racing cars. The fixed head coupes tend to be stiffer. But maybe in terms of the E-type, actually that little bit of flex gives it better traction, little lighter weight than having the full fixed head coupe. So Lucas Alusa still in third. And his advantage over Anthony Reid is still nearly 15 seconds. Reid is not finding the pace in the 250 short wheelbase that Lucas Halusa has got in the bread van. And the young Smoky E-Type has now dropped back down to fifth position, so they are losing pace quite badly. The Youngs are being caught by Oli Bryant as well because Oli Bryant's 1.4 seconds back and lapping quicker. So that's going to change before the end. And here it is Jack Young, number seven, Oli Bryant, number 10. This is the battle for fifth place, and there's traffic ahead as well as they come up now towards Lavant. Oli Bryant being careful not to cause the issue and put himself in jeopardy and damage any cars. They lap the Aston Martin of Gillian Goldsmith and Chris Woodgate. And then nose to tail as they come through with seven minutes and 48 seconds on the clock. Despite the smoke, Jack Young is hanging on in there in that fifth place. And look at the driver's side of the number 10 E-Type. There's the ding after that collision early on with the uh, white car that was started uh, by Gregor Fiskin, another former British GT racer, now being driven by Marino Franchitti a little further down the field. So you, know, you don't want to add any more damage to the car. Wally Bryant pulls out, has a look, knows he can't get through coming into the chicane. For a back marker's up ahead as well as the road gets drier, gets faster. The lap times continue to come down as they almost overlap over the timing line. Seven minutes to go in this 45-minute race. Jack Young, number seven, is on the inside as he dives through the traffic. And going with him is Ollie Bryant, so he can't really make a move at the moment. That just isn't the space and the width on the track, but he stays, crucially, on the tail of Jack Young for fifth spot as now they make the run down towards Ford Water. Yeah, now he is poised to attack, and the advantage is the track gets drier is the racing line the dry line is getting wider and wider so you can move offline and still hold traction and still keep a move together without losing control and without losing speed as well critically so this battle for fifth position ollie bryant still all over the back of jack young and he's still not managed to squeeze through now he's got a run going around the outside this is going to be the very long way round. can he pitch it in a la rob huff can he just dangle it all the way around the long way around the outside of the double right hander at Lavin. he can he is still there still there and if they had spotters here it'd be going outside outside he's still outside now he's in front so he moves up into fifth position and that was a long fought campaign and that was a four or five corner overtaking maneuver and it's not necessarily done yet either Jack Young wants the place back, six minutes to go. Dad John did a great opening stint, Holly Bryant having taken the car over from Martin O'Connell then, is now up into fifth position, but he can't relax for a moment. And despite the smoke, the number seven Young family E-type soldiers on. There is John Young, go on Jack, go on, go on, he says you might be able to get him yet before the end. Leaning over the pit wall, urging on his son. But Ollie Bryant, a more experienced driver, has the place for the moment as Jack Young swings through Madwick. 
going to update you on the battle for the lead, but I don't have to. Rob Huff is now 13.7 seconds back with only five minutes to go. His last lap was 2.2 seconds quicker than Phil Keane, and he is faster than anybody who's been at any stage in sector one of the race. So Huff on yet another flying lap. We talked about having to produce qualifying lap after qualifying lap. Well, he's half a second faster than the car went in wet qualifying, so he's certainly doing that. And the chase may yet be in vain, but it is definitely not being given up by Rob Huff. Nor is the chase being given up by Jack Young, number 7 E type, still pushing, pushing, pushing as they lap the Austin Healy of Carsten LeBlanc and Christian van Landschot. Out of Labyrinth, then the fight still raging on for fifth place. Further up the road, fourth is Anthony Reid, who in turn is not really making inroads into the gap of the Ferrari. Brad Van Lucas, a loser at the wheel of it. Now, is Jack Young going to be able to fight back? Yes, he is. Comes up alongside, goes through, gets the position back. Fantastic stuff. Jack Young retakes fifth spot as they dive down towards Woodcup. Dad's going grey about the moment here. John Young walks away, got better to watch anymore. There's a giant TV screen opposite the pit lane, so he knows exactly what is going on. And Jack Young there, great re retaliation this. He's got the position back again. And as they come over the line, yes, well done, Jack. Keep going, says John. Jack Young is fifth, and four minutes are on the clock. So he might have lost the place, but he wasn't going to take that as defeat, was he? No, I think another two laps and we'll be done this, plus one more perhaps, although Phil Keane is a long way ahead of this battle so what are they there sort of 40 odd seconds behind so we might get perhaps two more after this well, I think that's going to be stretching a little too much however for both drivers and for everybody else in a close battle like two more laps either to try and find a way by or to try and make sure they don't find a way by they shall not pass and all you've got to do here really is try and keep the car on the racing line and keep up your momentum these E-types are so similar in performance, trying to find that big advantage, you've got to have a mistake from the driver in front, really, to be able to fly by. Jack Young hanging on here to fifth place. Oli Bryant tucked up behind him, looking for a way back through. But at the moment, it is just not happening for him. But what about this run down towards Woodcut? No, he hasn't got the drive out of Labbert, so he has to stay on the tail of Jack Young. Three minutes to go. Phil Keane leads by 11 seconds. He's got enough in hand, but the gap certainly is tumbling from well over 20 odd seconds a few laps back to Rob Huff. But for fifth, there is Jack Young. Wonderful car control that he has picked up in a very short space of time. And as he accelerates down now in towards the chicane, there's no way through there for Oli Bryant. Two and a half minutes just over remain. A flying lap for the race leader is 91 seconds at the moment as the E-Times in this drag race come over the line almost side by side. And Jack Young has the tighter inside line for Madrick and he keeps the place. And it just looked for a fraction on that camera shot as though there might be a flake or two of snow returning to West Sussex. And that will not help driving conditions at all. At least say they were going far too fast for the conditions. At the moment, they're not. They're lapping far quicker than they did in the very wet aftermath of yesterday's snowstorm. And really leaning on these cars. And you can see the supple suspension of the E-Type Jag with its fully independent rear end, none of your cart springs. That's what gave the car such phenomenal traction. And uh, a, a, a wonderful, wonderful car to look at, particularly when it's been really leaned on hard by the driver, as these are, as Phil Keane is out front, as Rob Huff is in second place. Still, the Ferraris three and four, Lucas Salusa in the bread van, ahead of Anthony Reid in the 250 short wheelbase. And that battle, the two E-types for fifth and sixth. Race leader Phil Keane has just over a minute to run of the Moss Trophy, this race for GT cars of 1960 to 1962. And Phil Keane, having taken over from John Minshaw, has done a great job in this stint to maintain the advantage. Yes, the gap has come down. Rob Huff is catching him, but Phil Keane has done enough to be able to preserve this. A great opening stint done by John Minshaw. Adrian Wilmot's Aston Martin, started by Tom Alexander, gets out of the way. On the Ford racer back in the 1980s, Adrian Wilmot watches the E-Type wag its tail as it goes by. There's going to be one more lap at the end of this, but Phil Keane, 
who like John Minshaw, his co-driver, they partner one another in modern GT racing. He is out front looking for a race win, whereas Rob Huff is absolutely booked to the boards in second place. Yeah, Rob Huff not sparing the horses at all. Mind you, Phil Keane's not exactly either. 132.3 last time round. It's only half a second off his fastest race lap in the car. And Rob Huff, 130.111, only eight hundredths of a second off his fastest lap. He's had a fastest first sector of the race, decent second sector despite traffic. Is this another fastest lap of the race for Rob Huff? He was 130.103, and that's a 31 point, uh, 30.49, so three tenths of a second lost in traffic. Here's Lucas Alusa in third. Just, you see that little hand move? Right, calm down, Lucas, calm down. Don't spin it out of the chicane with a lap to go. He's hanging off to third place as Phil Keane works his way through the traffic. Turning their way now on towards St Mary's, Phil Keane with half a lap to go. Phil Keane, the race leader, looking as cool, calm and collected as ever. Rob Huff in second place, the gap's down to 7.6 seconds from what was 15 when he got into second place very nearly. Uh, he is comfortably clear of the Lucas Salusa bread van in third place and that now 19 seconds ahead of Anthony Reid's short wheelbase, 250. And so that means that uh, the bread van, barring some disaster for Lucas Halusa, is not going to be caught, and neither is the race leader. Phil Keane heads down towards Woodcut to win the Moss Trophy. John Minshaw started the Jaguar E-Type and had a great battle to maintain that race lead. Phil Keane takes it over, and it's going to be another success for this combination of drivers, which has racked up many a trophy in historic racing as well as modern GT racing. The Moss Trophy for GT cars of 1960-62 to 62 is won by the Jaguar E-Type. John Minshaw and Phil Keane victorious. Second goes the way of Rob Huff and Richard Mines, a car that had a spin early in the race. It ends up just under six seconds adrift. What might have happened but for Richard Mines being off the road earlier. And Emanuele Pirro is going to be third along with Lucas Haluza who brings the car to the chequered flag. And what about fourth? It should be the Ferrari of Vincent Gay and Anthony Reid. Anthony Reid will bring it home. And fifth and sixth is this great Jaguar battle. It is just Jack Young ahead at the moment in number seven. Ollie Bryant in the number 10 E-Type is tucked up behind him. They've traded places. And despite the smoke out of the back of the young fan, the E-Type Jack, I think he's just going to be able to hang on. He's got the chicane and then the drag race up to the timing line. Still to go out of the left-hander, back on the power. And yes, he's what, half a length ahead as they now accelerate up towards the line. John and Jack Young take fifth, and Martin O'Connell and Ollie Bryant round out the top six with seventh from pole position. The winners of this race back in 2014, Wolfgang Friedrichs and Simon Hadfield. But in 2018, the Moss Trophy won by John Minshaw and Phil Keane.